Hangover Square. Now this, this movie, someone came up to me in the lobby and said, this isn't really film noir, is it? And uh, you know, you could, you could take Hangover Square and you could put it into a number of different pigeonholes, uh, film noir, gothic, horror, the catch-all melodrama. Uh, uh, I picked up a term off the internet that I'll use, gaslight noir. How's that? Um, it, it's a very interesting film on a number of different levels, uh, scrupulously directed by John Brahm, who was one of the lesser known of the European immigrate directors who did some great work in the late 30s, 1940s, really a fine director. But first, sharing the spotlight with all of the actors is the composer who composed the music for this movie, uh, the great Bernard Herrmann. Benny Herman was huge, huge of ambition, huge of talent, uh, huge of ego. And in this particular movie, Hangover Square, I can't think of another composer's work that not only plays a central part of the film, but is also a central part of the whole story of the film, and that is the Concerto Macabre. So I'm really privileged to have uh, my good friend and colleague, filmmaker, producer, author, Stephen Smith here with us today, who is Bernard Herrmann's biographer. <laughs> what an incredibly well photographed film. All of the compositions and shooting down through the lamp lights and the cat and the candles and the walking through the puddle. I mean, I think Brahm just kind of got turned loose uh, to, to make this. What, uh... He did, and uh, it was a rare case where a composer got to work very early on in a film mm -hmm. and with a friend, because Bernard Herrmann and John Brahm were good friends. Uh -huh. And so much as uh, Herrmann had worked very closely with Orson Welles on their first film together, which you may have seen, Citizen Kane, <laughs> the very first movie not only for Welles but for Bernard Herrmann, who was a New Yorker that Welles brought to Hollywood in 1940 to score Kane. Well, um, Herman was suspicious of a lot of people from Hollywood. He loved Hollywood musicians. He loved uh, the craft and the art, as he considered it, of film music. But he really didn't care for a, a large number of people in Hollywood that he considered as phonies and backstabbers. And he just couldn't tolerate anyone who pretended to know his job or any producer or studio executive who dared to come over and tell him what he should do with his music. Uh, Sounds like a very perceptive fellow. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have to say, <laughs> I have to say that, and I will come back to, what, to your question, Alan, but yeah. I just, I always feel very defensive about uh, Benny as he was known to his friends because he yeah. was famous for his tirades. He was a difficult, explosive person and some of his rages were irrational. But I would say 90% of them were because he had incredibly high standards mm -hmm. and he was frustrated when people didn't live up to what he saw as his standards. And when he worked with a John Brahm or a Wells mm -hmm. or a Hitchcock, things went extremely well mm -hmm. and he was very open to ideas. It right. was when someone like, I'll go ahead and name one director, William Friedkin approached him to score The Exorcist many years later and according to Herman said, these are the instruments I want you to use, this is what I want, this is the first <laughs> meeting. And Herman grabbed his daughter uh, Dorothy's hand and walked out of the meeting and said, we're getting out of here. You know, he, he would just literally get up and walk away as soon as he heard people start talking to him in a way telling that, him how to do, how do things. So, yeah, yeah. so yes, he was difficult, but he was usually right. And in this case, um, and I just would like to say one other thing to contextualize a bit, Herman, unlike most of the famous film composers we love, the Max Steiners and Korngold and so forth, he never signed a contract to be a staff composer in any studio. He wanted to be an independent. He was a fiercely independent person. And he would come out to Hollywood from his home in New York. Uh, he moved to Hollywood in the 50s, but at the time he made this, and this was uh, scored in 1944, released 45, he was living in New York. His wife at the time was Lucille Fletcher, uh, who had just written a very successful radio play, Sorry, Wrong Number, that became a great film. And uh, so he, he was a New Yorker who would visit Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And usually composers just had a few weeks to write a score and a giant staff sometimes of orchestrators and musical copyists would surround that composer and the composer would, would write sketches very kind of sometimes very 
uh, simple ideas of, of the music and leave the choice of instruments to others. Well, Herman insisted on writing all of his own orchestrations. He insisted on writing every note, choosing every single French horn and bassoon and high woodwind, as you heard in that score. And uh, he said that for a composer to not do the, the orchestration was like a painter not choosing the color. And color is such an important part of his music. So this is about as ideal a situation as you can get in that his friend John Brahm told him we have this film, Hangover Square, which had been reconceived from a novel by Patrick Hamilton that was actually a 20th century set novel, which they heavily changed to be much more, as you mentioned, Alan, like The Lodger, a sort of right. gaslight noir. I love yeah. that phrase. And instead of having a few weeks to score the film, Herman had, according to the notes on his own score, essentially five months. He started it in July, he finished it in December, which was sadly the month that Larry Krager died. Uh, so he had to write, for obvious reasons, now that you've seen the film, he had to write the piano concerto before filming. Right. So he had all this time, and he was, a, at that time, a, a dividing his time between concert music and film music. He had his concert works played by the New York Philharmonic and other great orchestras. And so he was no stranger to, to classical form, and that's how he was trained. And so he loved writing what he later called the Concerto Macabre. I noticed, right. of course, it is the uh, Concerto for Piano and Orchestra in that uh, program we see in the film, mm -hmm. but for all intents and purposes, when it was later recorded, uh, Herman titled it the Concerto Macabre. Right. And I just wanted to quote briefly um, about something that John Brahm had said about sh Please do. shooting mm -hmm. that sequence. Um, Brahm said, the music stimulated me so much for a long time, I had been dissatisfied with the photography of music and films. Musicians themselves are uninteresting. It is what they play that should be photographed. I myself could not read a note of music, but when Herman came and saw the finished film, he could not believe it. I had photographed his music. So he was That's very, right. very happy. Well, that, that was, that was going to be my next question, is how he felt about the outcome. Yeah. Because uh, in the introduction, talking about Laird Cragar being wanting to be someone that he wasn't in a, in a yes. certain way wasn't Herman uh, you know Max Steiner really thought of himself first and foremost and always as a film composer mm -hmm. I believe and that was not the way Herman perceived himself at all not what he really wanted to well, be. Well yeah and it's I have to answer that carefully you're right he wanted to be seen as a composer and what he liked to say was that a composer and, and it's interesting if he were living today, well, he wouldn't be employable because he'd make too many enemies and musicians don't have the, uh, composers don't have the protection of, say, an Alfred Newman, who was the head of the music department, who would right. basically be a go-between for Herman and everybody else, so he was mm -hmm. heavily protected. But Herman is very much of our time in that composers can be parts of rock bands, they can write a ballet, they can write a symphony, they can, there's, there's very little distinction between high and low music, mm -hmm. and much as the subject of, of this film is about George Harvey Bone being torn between high and low music, right. well that was very much a, a, a perception of the time. I mean, Gershwin was pilloried by both the Broadway camps and the classical camps when he wrote Porgy and Bess, because they said, what is it, you know? Right. And his, Gershwin's feeling, which we now accept, was music is music. Mm -hmm. And that was Herman's feeling. He felt that you could write a symphony, a film score, radio scores, which he did hundreds of, television scores, he wrote great scores for Twilight Zone, symphonies, yes. he wrote a terrific symphony. And as he said, Mozart wrote dinner party music, and Haydn had to eat in the kitchen. And at least I don't have to eat in the kitchen. <laughs> so, so it's not that he disparaged film music, but he just didn't want to be seen as someone who wrote that one category. He didn't want to be a film composer. And I think you know, who he really wanted to be, the tragedy of his life, is that he didn't want to be a successful composer in film only. He wanted to be essentially what Leonard Bernstein became, which is someone who could move between all those different worlds, right. which Bernstein was criticized for, but which he did successfully, writing for On the Waterfront, orchestral music. Concerts for young people. Yes, concerts for young people, yeah. conducted the New York's uh, Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. So Benny's life is something of a tragedy and something of a great success in that mm -hmm. this incredibly opinionated, angry man could have such a long and successful career in Hollywood from 1940 when he arrived to 1975, Christmas Eve 1975, after years of being unhirable in Hollywood because rock and roll and pop scores had taken over the soundtracks mm -hmm. and frankly he'd made enemies of just about everyone including Hitchcock unfortunately. So Herman had moved to London with his third wife 
And sometimes nothing makes you more uh, in demand than going away. And this new generation of directors, Scorsese, De Palma, uh, once they realized he was still alive, asked Bernard Herrmann to score their films. Christmas Eve, 1975, Bernard Herrmann came back from his home in London, uh, he was a great Anglophile, to Los Angeles, supervised the recording of the score for Taxi Driver, which he had just completed, mm -hmm. uh, finished the last session, went out to dinner with friends, went home, went to sleep, and never woke up at age 64. Yeah. So yeah. Just, it was just an amazing life oh, full God. of perfect timing, mm -hmm. a great deal of drama, and yet I have to say that unlike his, his good friend and great collaborator Wells, who we know didn't finish many films, mm -hmm. uh, Herman was a consummate professional. Yeah. But when it came down to it, done. you know, if they re and we know mm -hmm. movies get recut to the last minute, and that was true then as now, mm -hmm. not this one in particular, but in general. And he understood that, and because he scored so many live radio shows, he'd just say, well, we'll cut from bar 62 to bar 64. It mm -hmm. wasn't that he was pounding his fist saying, no, my music is right, sacrosanct. Right, right. He was very, very right. practical.